Now, we go back to our cheery uh, prophecy. Isaiah 7, 3, it begins. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out to meet Ahaz, you in Shear Joshua, for a remnant shall return, which his, name, his son's name means, your son, at the end of the aqueduct from the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field. So God says, you go there, and the king will be there. Just, just take your son, go, you'll meet the king there. Sure enough, the king is there. He's, he's, he's walking by faith, he's, he's going prophetically, and he's right on target. And the prophecy he's supposed to say in verse 4, Take heed, be quiet, do not fear or be faint-hearted for these two stubs of smoking firebrands. For the fierce anger of Rezidim in Syria and Pekka, son of Ramalia. They don't give Pekka's name here, but it is Pekka who was the son of Ramalia. Because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Ramalia have plotted evil against you. Singular. The singular you here is because he's speaking to the king personally. You, I'm addressing. Don't fear. Don't worry. I will take care of you. So, and their plot have plotted evil against you, saying, let us go up against Judah and trouble it and let us make a gap in the wall for ourselves and set a king over them. And we, we talked about the son of Tabel, Tabel. And it's supposed to mean the son of Tabeel, which means God is good. But Tabel, he called him good for nothing. So they want to put up a puppet king so that they have the three kingdoms ready to fight against Assyria. A common enemy, if you will. Now I'm going to move along here. A little review there. Okay. Let's get this. Here we go. Isaiah 7, verses 7 through 9. Thus says the Lord God, It shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be broken, so that it will not be a people. Ephraim here does, does speak of the tribe of Ephraim, but often when he's speaking to the ten tribes of Israel, he calls them Ephraim. Partly because the capital city was at Ephraim, and it was the largest of all the tribes of those ten tribes. So this is, in 65 years, that kingdom that you're worried about will not even exist. The Assyrians will eventually uh, invade, take them captive, and, and then displace many of them, or most of them, somewhere in the kingdom of Assyria. So, so that it will not be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Ramalia's son, if you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. When I first read this, and in context, it looks like he's still speaking to Ahaz. But he switches to the plural you. And so it includes Ahaz and the whole kingdom of Judah. Or if you will, God's people. It speaks to us. And it particularly speaks to the Jews. We mentioned at the end of last class. If Christ had been received by the Jews and they had believed they would have been established as a kingdom in 30 A.D. They rejected their king and were not established. At the end of the, of the Great Tribulation, the whole nation of Israel, as it says in Romans, all of Israel shall be saved. They will believe that Jesus is Messiah, and then they will be established. So he's speaking of, of things way in the future suddenly. So he switches from you singular to you plural. This is a promise made to all of Israel. This is what Israel needs to do. And God will at some point make sure Israel does it. So, from there, uh, skip on here. Oh, oh, this is it. This is very important. The reason Ahaz is not killed, the reason Jerusalem does not fall, the reason the house of David David is not destroyed in the royal seat is because God has made an eternal promise to David, and, and here it is. Uh, in verse 12, well, let's see where I want to start. Nathan the prophet was given this prophecy to give King David during his lifetime, but it speaks about his, his, uh, his children and his children's children. 
So it says, furthermore, I tell you that the Lord will build you a house, and it shall be when the days are fulfilled, when you must go to be with your fathers, that I will set up your seed after you, who will be of your sons, and I will establish his kingdom. Someone in the lineage of David, someone who is his seed, is going to have a kingdom set up. And this kingdom is not normal. Look at this thing in verse 12. He shall build me a house, and I will establish his throne forever. A physical person from the seed of David with his genes is going to set up an eternal kingdom. This is unusual. And I will be, a, I will be his father, and he shall be my son, and I will not take my mercy away from him, as I took it from him who was before you. And I will establish him in my house and in my kingdom forever. So we've talked about the one who is eternal being begotten, a begotten son in Psalm 2. Now we see the begotten son living forever. So he goes from eternity to time to eternity. This is our Lord. This is our Savior. This is Jesus. It's only true of him. And I will establish him in my house and in my kingdom forever, and his throne shall be established forever, according to all these words and according to all this vision. So Nathan spoke to David. This is why lousy Ahaz is not destroyed. <laughs> you cannot wipe out the house of David in the, in the royal seed until one born of the royal seed, the Lord Jesus Christ, is born in Bethlehem. Can't do it. We have a promise to him. So, he's being blessed by his great ancestor, King David. Now, moreover, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for yourself. Singular. He's speaking just to Ahaz. For the Lord your God, ask it either in the depths or in the height above. This, write this in your notes. God just offered Ahaz a blank check. <coughs> Anybody here ever get a blank check? <laughs> he has a blank check. Any sign you want, in the heavens, in the depths of the sea, anything you want, I will do exactly what you say to prove to you that I have power to deliver you from your enemies. What he's trying to do Instead of, I want to say, uh, picking him apart from all the evil he's done, he's trying to build a capacity for faith in God in King Ahaz. Knowing that if, if he asks for a sign and I perform the sign, then he has reasons to believe that I'm going to do everything else that I said. And this is remarkable. He's out, Isaiah is out soul winning with his son. That's what he's doing here. He's trying to win a wicked king instead of rebuking him. <clears throat> now, Ahaz responds, I will not ask nor will I test the Lord or tempt the Lord, depending on your translation. Now something is going on here. We are told in Deuteronomy, you shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Massa. <clears throat> We're not supposed to test or tempt God. That's a principle in Scripture. But this is this is, he's misapplying this. And I'll give you an example. I know someone who has a million dollars who could give it to me tomorrow. I don't know if they want, but if I, but I would never ask them for that million dollars. But if they said to me, would you like a million dollars? i say, yes! <laughs> you see the difference? Now how many are like that? Somebody you know, you're, you're short on money and they got it, but you won't ask them, right? But if they said to you, would you like some? Yes, please, right away. Well, this is the difference. He's not, he's not testing God. God is asking him to be tested. It's, it's a big difference here. And he turns down seeing a sign which would have created capacity for faith in God, which he ha seems to have none of. It's almost like he really does not want a sign. He does not want a reason to believe. He wants to continue as an idol worshiper. That seems to be what's going on. Now, a uh, couple things here. 
Isaiah is out soul winning with his son, Shir Joshua. The target is the king. And what's going on here? This actually reveals the heart of God. That's why I love this part of the prophecy. In 1 Peter 3, 9, we see God's heart towards this king. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish. I'm going to put including Ahaz, okay? But that all should come to repentance. God seriously is giving him every reason to believe. It will not stop here either. It will not stop. He's trying to win this king's soul. This is one of the reasons why I have problems with people who, who believe that, you know, people are predestined to heaven or hell. And God decides before they're born and they have no say in it. I, I, I detest it. Because God is doing everything he can to win this man. What's he secretly hardening his heart so he won't believe? <laughs> Does God have two wills? I mean, that's what you're saying. Oh, he's trying to win him, but really he's hardening his heart so he can you know, throw him in the fire. This attacks the nature of God. It actually attacks the nature of God. We see Ahaz exercising his free will, and God exercising his free will. And God is trying to win him. That's God's will. It's will. Nothing should perish, not even Ahaz. And he goes after him. And whatever school you're up with this, we should be, have that heart to go after sinners no matter how good or how bad they are. Amen. And one of the great lessons, like I said, when you look at the kings of Israel, 18 or 19 bad kings in a row, and every single one of them God reveals himself to trying to win them. <laughs> you know, this is what we call, call it extravagant grace. Uh, how, would you, how would you... It's like... Why, why would he do that? He loves them. He does not want to see them in hell, and he goes after them. And this is what we see him doing to Ahaz. We see his mercy being shown in Ahaz to the nth degree. Now, well, I'll show him his mercy, and he'll respond. No, I'll show him his mercy and give him an opportunity to believe, and he will exercise his free will and not believe. And he does it here. So, let's continue with this. Jesus has his heart, we see it in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19. He's winning Zacchaeus, who's a, who's a crooked tax collector. And when he calls Zacchaeus by name up on a tree and says, I'm eating dinner at your house tonight, Zacchaeus declares, I will restore full fold and fourfold anything I've cheated anybody of. And Jesus says, today salvation has come to your house because he also is a son of Abraham. Whoa! crooked tax collector. Just call him the son of Abraham because he believes on Jesus. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. The God of the Old Testament is not different from the God of the New Testament. The God of the Old Testament went after a wicked sinner called Ahaz. And here Jesus is calling after a sinner named Zacchaeus. His will is that none should perish, that all should come to the knowledge of the truth. And we see the heart of God going out to win people. And he wants us to have that heart towards them. Now, back to our prophecy. We finally get to it. Ahaz has turned down his sign. So, a second sign is offered, but this time the sign is not offered to Ahaz. It's offered to the whole house of Judah. And then he said, Hear now, O house of David. Believe it or not, many commentators from good books do not seem to get it that he's no longer speaking to Ahaz and he's speaking to the whole house of David. And these are two different side-by-side -side, uh, segments. And they deal with, with different issues, but it's very clear. He changes who he's speaking to. To make that even more sure in the Hebrew... It says, here now, O house of David, it is a small thing for you, plural, to weary men. You, the whole house of David, you have given yourselves to idolatry as Ahaz has. And you have wearied God, <coughs> you plural, all of you. In English we'd say, you guys. All you guys. That's how we would do it in English. Because English doesn't have a plural, modern English does not have a plural you. So, we have to add something on. 
to let people know that. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you, plural, a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, <laughs> this gets really wild. I'm going to ask you a question. I don't know. We'll discuss this. Maybe I'm looking for good ideas I haven't thought of yet. Why give these two signs side by side? He offers a sign to wicked Ahaz, who turns it down. And then he says, I have a sign for the whole house of David. A virgin-born son, who is God with us, is going to be given to you. Why would he waste his time in such a wonderful prophecy for Ahaz to hear and give them one, you know, one right after another? And I'm going to give you one clue. Yes. Maybe he's going on the record for down the stream of time <coughs> so people can say, hey, see? Okay. Oh, down the see. Okay. All right, I think I think I think you're 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 beginning to get at. Uh, first of all, we are made in God's image, and in a certain sense, God's mind works in a similar way that ours works in this way. When you think of one thing, your mind connects it with other things like it. Now you think of one thing, and then something else comes to mind that's somehow related to one another in your mind. The relation may be kind of strange, but it's there. That's how we think. In God's mind, these two things are related in some way. Anybody else with a suggestion on how they're related? And I'm going to give you my thoughts on it here. Why he would give this to Ahaz and give it at this time. This is an event that will happen 700 years later. It will not be a sign to Ahaz. It will not encourage him that he's going to win a battle because the virgin is going to conceive won't be, you know, she's 700 years in the future. You'll never see this thing. You have any any ideas on this? Yes, I got to see. Okay. The heart of whosoever wills, who wills, whosoever believes. Yes, yes. He would give a promise to Ahaz, and whether we believe it or not. In the same way that he offered Ahaz a sign, he offered us a sign, the sign of the virgin birth. Okay? Uh, Josh, God uses... Let's see. Uses the weak to make himself known. That's interesting, yes. He's using Ahaz here. <laughs> he found a way to use Ahaz. That's an interesting thought. Yeah. Okay. All right. Anybody else? I don't. Yeah. I, this is like a, you know, well, these deep theological questions, but in God's mind they're related. Here's my take on it. <coughs> when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, there was a certain star that was seen in the east, and Magi came to Jerusalem and said, "We have seen his star in the east." Where is the king of the Jews? How many of those Jews went with the Magi to Bethlehem to check the thing out? None. Zero. That sign was received just as well as Ahaz received his son. <laughs> and the idea is whether they believe it or not, whether they... I will show my goodness and grace and will give them a sign if they will just take heed. In the same way that Ahaz rejected God's promise, the sign of the Messiah by the Jews was, was in a great deal rejected. They, they somehow fit together in the mind of God. Now, that's my opinion. You can take that. We'll put that on the test. You know, <laughs> but it's an interesting thing. Let's keep going with this here. Now, the attack on the virgin birth by theologians. <coughs> this is interesting. 
Isaiah 7.14 is perhaps one of the most well-known <clears throat> passages in the book of Isaiah. It's also one of the most controversial for many reasons. So, we're going to look at in what way theologians, liberal theologians, attack this thing, and we are going to beat them at their own game. I want you to be able to defend the virgin birth as stated in Isaiah. Here we are. And I, I read this, it was interesting, it's really true. It's difficult to get through the Christmas or Easter season without seeing one of the major news periodicals or educational television networks cast doubt about the meaning of Alme, which is the word virgin used in Isaiah 7.14. A favorite argument is that the Hebrew word Alme cannot mean virgin, but instead refers to a young woman of maritable age without respect to prior sexual activity. And these same theologians, quote, I don't know, I call them fake scholars, they don't, they don't fully look at the scriptures. The more precise word for virgin is, that it would be pronounced batole, a word used in Isaiah, not used in Isaiah 7.14. And then they say, well, you know, Matthew, we're often told when he did his, when he, when he quoted Isaiah 7.14, mistakenly assumed the term meant virgin when it does not. What they're saying is, Isaiah never intended to say there was a virgin birth. He just said a young woman gave birth. Anybody here have an NIV Bible? You got one. Sometimes I call it the non-intelligent version. <laughs> now, it's not always bad. But in this place, it says, it says young woman or maiden. It doesn't say virgin. Okay? And there are people, and so there's no sign at all. Well, we're going to show you why that does not hold up and why Alme, the word that Isaiah used there, is the best word to convey this thing in Hebrew. Now, we have a cultural problem going on here. In the Jewish culture, and in many ancient cultures, it was the father's responsibility to keep his virgin. What that means is, you as a parent were to make sure that on your daughter's wedding day, she was a virgin. So in a culture that took that seriously, how do you do that? You never allow that girl ever to be alone with a man. And there are cultures alive and, and today who do that with their daughters. My first glimpse at this thinking, and it has some wisdom to it, uh, I'm in Puerto Rico and I'm out in my neighborhood sharing, meeting neighbors, sharing the gospel with them. And I notice every time I see a little girl running down the street playing, either grandma or mom is, is there watching. She's never unattended. And the Puerto Ricans, they said to me, it's not that we don't trust the girls, we don't trust the boys. <laughs> so an interesting thought. So in this kind of culture, because this, and if, and if a girl is left unattended without a chaperone, not only is she considered to be immoral, but the family is considered to be irresponsible. It's a shame to the whole family. So you just don't do this. In that kind of culture, it's very easy for the word for maiden and the word for virgin to kind of get mixed. Because a maiden, a young girl, is a virgin. 99 and one half percent of the time. And words that have similar meanings have a way in languages of you know, getting used interchangeably. And I think some of that is going on in the Hebrew. There are three words that could have been used. We'll look at all three words. I will not go into this much detail in other places, but this is the virgin birth. This is our Messiah. We believe that God became a man in the womb of the Virgin Mary. This is, this is paramount. This is critical. This is a cardinal doctrine of the faith. So I want you to be able to defend it. And actually, and I shouldn't say this, but embarrass people with the, the argument they're using. So, we Man. want to blow this argument right out of the water quickly. We'll do Man. that. Man. Okay? In the Greek, when the Septuagint was written, remember? 72 scholars go to Alexandria, translate the Hebrew into the Greek. It may not have happened all at once, but 
at least 150 or 200 years before Christ is born, there is a Greek Bible of the Old Testament Scriptures. And in it, it is the, the virgin birth here, it's Parthenos. They translate it with a Greek word that means virgin. No question. So the translators, who were Hebrews, the 72 men who translated out of Greek, <coughs> believed that this was a promise of a virgin birth. That's how they translated it. So that gives you the Jewish mindset on what's going on here. It's very clear. They believe in this miracle. This is messianic. The Jews taught this thing. They were looking for a virgin birth. Then, this other word that supposedly is better, this uh, betule. Let's look at it. And this is what the liberal theologians are saying. If it really was a virgin birth, they would have used betule, because betule is a word that always means virgin. And what it shows is they haven't read their Bible well. Okay? They have not. I'm going to show you why. Here it is. Uh, it's, it's often betrayed by some liberal-leaning scholars as the best word to betray someone who is a virgin. And alme they betray as a more general term for a young woman. Thus they claim that Isaiah 7, 14, when it says a alme shall conceive and bring forth the son, it simply means a young woman shall conceive and does not demand a virgin birth. There are several holes in your logic. Let's look at them. We've got time. We have time. Good. We'll go. <laughs> Here's the verse. Go to the book of Joel. Chapter 1, verse 8. Lament like a virgin, a batule, or a batule, I'm not sure which way that is actually said, girded with sackcloth for the husband of your youth. The Batule here, or Batule, is a woman, a young woman who has been married, her husband has died, and she is grieving for him. Is she a virgin? No. Can't be. She's been married. Her husband has died while she's young, and she's grieving for him. This word has a general use. Batule does not always signify a virgin, a sexually inactive female. In this case, it's speaking of a young woman whose husband has died. A married woman, in this case, is a betule. So it's not the best word, clearly. And when you come to defining what a word means in the scriptures, the best place to go is look up every place in the Bible that word is used yeah. and let the Bible define what it means. That's, good. That's the standard. Yeah. Because... Words don't always convey everything we want them to. And you can take a word from a secular language, guess it's the best word out there. And then how do you use it in the Bible to define what God says it means in the scriptures? Yes, Matthew. Um, words change meanings over time. So these words, a lot of these words have changed meanings once they get to the time of the rabbis writing writing the uh, commentary, the yes. Talmud, and, and so they start using the Talmudic definition instead of the biblical definition, but you're supposed to be using the Bible to, to understand the Bible. Yeah, a scribe three or four hundred years later will look at this word and may have a different idea of its meaning than when Joel prophesied it. Yeah. But he's inspired to say, Batule, a woman who's been married, husband is dead, she can't be a virgin. So this Batule does not always mean virgin like these liberal scholars are trying to say. Yes? One minute left on the recording. What? One minute left on the recording. What? One minute left. One minute left? Oh boy. Alright. Talk quick. One more here. We'll give you one more instance and do it quick and then we're really out of time anyways. We'll do this. I want you to read this. Genesis 24 It's the story of Rebecca uh Abraham's servant has been sent back to Haran to find a relative for his son to marry Isaac. In this scripture, in this chapter, all three words that, that Isaiah could have used are in this chapter. And they're used interchangeably. And we will look at them next week. We will see uh, Nara, which is a young woman, is in this chapter. Betule is in this chapter, and Alme is in this chapter.
That's it for now. Amen. Beautiful. Amen. Okay.